Our last speaker of the day is Professor Shi Zhang. She is a professor here in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and he has also been on the Scientific Organizing Committee for the past many, many months. He's been working tremendously hard in the back uh, all day, every day, uh, recording all of our talks and making sure the computer doesn't uh, reset itself or, or glitch. And so he's been working extremely hard on this, and I really want to thank him for all the work he's put in. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so today, um, I'm, I'm here for a little bit, you know, particular role here because I was a um, student participation, you know, a participant in 2011 Beijing Summer School. Okay. So this summer school, it took me five years from a student to becoming an organizing committee. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about some atmosphere dynamics I did uh, in the last few years. And uh, everything started from the Beijing Summer School. This is the Summer School. Okay. And the theme at that time is called a Starting Planetary Formation. Okay. So we change the theme every year, actually. And uh, it's in Cavalry Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics in Beijing. It's actually in Peking University. It's uh, you know, a little bit late, um, but roughly at the same time in the summer, okay, in 2011. And at the time, we call it you know, ICMA. Now we change it to Cavalry Summer School now. Okay, here is a good picture. At that time, uh, the Cavalry Institute of Astronomy and Astrophysics in Beijing was actually just funded okay, by Cavity Foundation. And the first director is Doug Lin here. He looked young at that time, you see. He's not here, right? And uh, here's Pascal, and uh, Eugene, and uh, Li Haman, you know, those old folks here. And uh, this is Adam Schumann. Okay, I worked with him uh, to study atmospheric dynamics. And uh, somehow, you know, um, I didn't, you know, learn atmospheric dynamics, and that, uh, you know, before that. At that time, I was uh, like third-year grad student, and uh, I was doing photochemical simulations for Titan and Venus, and studying some like radio transfer projects. Yeah. By the way, at that time, Michael Lai and me, we we were thinking about developing a Bayesian uh, optimization retrieval framework for exoplanet um, atmospheres. Roughly at that time, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, if you don't know who is Michael I just record the picture Laura just showed. And, uh, okay, so, but you know, this is a good opportunity for grad students to jump out of the box, what you are doing right now, to think about maybe you will never try your graduate, you know, career, right? And so I, you know, take some risk and I try to do some atmosphere general circulation models with Adam Schumann, I try to learn something. And it turns out, I feel very interested in that, okay? So after my graduation, you know, 2012, I, you know, went to postdoc in University of Arizona working with him, and uh, we did a bunch of interesting stuff, okay? Using uh, simple models. So this is actually was my 2011 project. At that time, you know, Juno was, you know, still on the ground, and, uh, this is called a convectively generated zonal jets by thunderstorms on Jupiter. So basically, what we did is we took a you know, dynamics model, we put thunderstorms, you know, because Jupiter has a lot of thunderstorms. If you, can, you, know, you can take an image and you see a lot of lightning in there. And uh, how, you know, to try to generate zonal jets, banded structures of Jupiter from these thunderstorms, okay, using a very simple two-dimensional shallow water model. And uh, I still remember, uh, I, uh, I gave a final talk. You know, every student needs to give a final talk. I gave a final talk 14 hours before Judo Nudge. Okay, so now, you know, we, we just need to wait for 11 days. Juno will arrive Jupiter. Okay. And uh, you can see, this is longitude. This is latitude. This is a full global simulation. And, uh, you know, this is the vorticity, which is basically the curvature of the wind field. 
and you can see a lot of vortex and you see body structures here is zonal mean zonal wind you can see we have a lot of body structures turns out the equatorial super rotation is totally the opposite direction okay so we cannot simulate that it turns there's some reason for that okay so equatorial super rotation can only be generated in a, for the Jupiter regime you can only be generated 3d simulations okay this is 2d so it's very different but anyhow you know that that actually really attract me to think about this kind of stuff so how to use idealized models to understand things we observe okay so basically you know the start point is we use two-dimensional shallow water model it's like a minimum recipe you can actually understand general circulations winds and temperature distributions for giant planets okay so you know the first point is dynamics might be understood in idealized models okay and I just basically, you know, um, describe what the model looks like. It's like two-dimensional, single-layer shallow water model. And the shallow water layer looks like this. You can, you know, change the thickness. And you with a very deep layer, which, you know, didn't change. But you can have, you know, momentum exchange between the uh, upper layer and lower layer. So it's basically you can simulate a stratified layer overlaying sitting on a convective layer you put a thunderstorms in a boundary and you see what's going on uh, in the you know you know in the shallow water layer and you can see jets going on okay and how to understand this kind of stuff is actually you know I'm trying to think because you know I have to think about it simply and uh, this is can be understood in the forced dissipative system if you still remember what uh, you know Chris told in, during his lecture you know we talk about forcing and dissipation and we can understand this kind of a system. Okay, so a lot of advantage for simplified models, right? First, it's a simple, uh, simple system, so the physics are relatively simple, and maybe you can understand. But you know, simple system cannot be even simpler, right? So it has to capture the essential physics, so you know what's going on there. And of course, simple system, you know, you have to do, you can do that quick simulations, and you can do long-term integration. And all, those, all of those, you know, give you some um, advantages, okay? And I just quickly show two of the simulations. The first one, uh, this is latitude, and this is the longitude. It to put, you know, put a moist convection on, in, the, in the convective layer, and it drive the jets in the, in the upper layer. And here you show, you know, the thickness changes, and you see jets developing here. And this is the uh, wings, and you see, you know, some bands and you see you develop a very uh, strong westward jet and equator and here a different simulation with different parameters and you can see isotropic turbulence you never see this kind of steady jet at the equator so what's the difference between the two okay so actually if we think about it in terms of forcing and the dissipation those two can be understood in a simple framework of forcing and the dissipation. So basically, jet formation can be understood in terms of forcing and dissipation. Here is the radiative damping and the, as a dissipation mechanism. So if your damping is very strong, and uh, if your forcing is very high, you don't know which one wins. But if your internal heat flux, which you know, gives you the forcing, is very low, but your damping is very strong, so the eddies cannot merge together and do a inverse cascade to form a zonal banded jet, you will end up, you know, isotopic turbulence. On the other hand, if you have a high energy input rate and the radiative damping is really weak, so, you know, those eddies and those turbulence, you know, in the 2D system, they actually tend to, you know, have, have time to interact and, uh, you know, those eddy mean interaction can accelerate the zonal flows and you have this kind of banded you know structures those are very simple okay not 3d but 2d but you can you know this is a very basic um, uh, geofluid and uh, geofluid dynamics um, point of view in terms of the inverse cascade uh, in the 2d system and but you know although this framework is simple you can still think about how to apply to um, the real world for example you know for the in for, when you uh, think about brown dwarfs and Jupiter, you know, Jupiter has a low energy input rate. Jupiter is colder, right? 
And uh, brown dwarfs, for example, you know, M dwarfs, L dwarfs, or you know, uh, T dwarfs, those dwarfs are hotter than Jupiter. Maybe you will have more internal flux, right? It's hotter. Emission more flux. And uh, you have strong convection from interiors. In terms of radio damping, if you have a larger temperature, of course the radio damping is strong, right? So it turns out that you don't know which one wins, right? Here you you would you have jet, but you don't know, right? Because Jupiter is in this regime, but Jupiter is also in this regime. Okay, the M dwarf or L dwarf in this regime, but L dwarf is also in this regime. This is a big question mark. So we take advantage to do like two D modeling. You can do statistics, right? And you can run a bunch of models. You can run hundreds of models of those kind of stuff by changing your energy input rate from a bottom. And also change your relaxation type, you know, in the upper layer. All of this kind of stuff is very idealized, but can give you some hint. It turns out that for the first time we realize that there is a strong boundary between the isotropic turbulence like you know flow versus the zonal jet flow. Okay, it's very sharp, you know, boundary there. It turns out, you know, it's it's you know, if you still recall what I said here. If you have a strong damping and a low internal flux, you are end up in the isotropic turbulence. So you you expect this regime like this. Okay. So Jupiter is definitely in this regime because we observe that. But for brown dwarfs, we don't know. Okay, because we need observations to estimate the relaxation type and energy input rate. Okay, so brown dwarf, whether it's ju more Jupiter-like or whether it's more like you know isotropic eddies, we still don't know. Okay, what we can observe right now for brown dwarf is actually the light curve variations. Okay, so for simple, you know, two D shallow warmer model, you can you can integrate for a long time, so you can see this kind of integrated flux, you know, proxy changes with time, and uh, you know this variation is about like five percent. Of course, it depends on your parameter, but this, you know. Something is related to what we have observed for Brandorf light curve variations. Okay, so this is an interesting, you know, scenario to think about. Maybe you can understand light curve variations in terms of a very simple model. Okay, so uh, as Nora just mentioned that we have like three D stuff now, so we have to think about three D, right? So what is the minimum recipe for three D atmosphere, right? I have to think about it. first. We need a good forcing pattern. Okay, not too complicated. If you put clouds everywhere, it's too complicated. Okay, and you have a linear radiative relaxation. So and put a linear friction. Very simple. Can we still understand the problem? Okay, for tidally locked planet, can we understand this? And can we solve it on the back of that envelope? Okay, actually sounds like a, you know mission impossible, and it took. Almost several years in Schumann Group to develop this framework. Okay, first is actually done by Dallas Project Becker. Another 2011 summer school project. Okay, people derived this for 2D system, and then Ted sitting here and do it in the regimes, and uh, you know finally we figure out maybe we can unify them together and achieve an analytic solution from first principle. And you can predict what the temperature difference between day side and night side and wind speed are hot Jupiter's. Okay, so of course there are some you know assumptions, but this is very useful for people who don't want to run 3D general circulation models, right? And we are going to test how good is compared with different simulations, right? This is what it looks like. I didn't choose any parameter, okay? But it turns out this is temperature contrast, this is wind speed. This equatorial J width and this is J core pressure. Everything actually roughly fitting well. Okay, so you know, in principle, maybe you can actually down this kind of stuff on the you know on the back of an envelope and compare with complicated three D simulations. Okay, so and also for the phase shift, we have a small simple theory to explain those phase shift changes with different compositions and those simple theory. Depends, you know, a radio time scale and vacuum time scale actually corresponding well with the, uh, you know, 3D GCM simulations. So actually, I think this is a good theory, and we can predict this kind of stuff 
for observers and people doing retrievals, you don't need to run just yet, right? And of course, you have to see test post on Friday for model observations compar comparison, okay? And I will skip this. So this is, you know, people said I have to link to the project. This is my project. And the influence of planetary obliquity of atmospheric dynamics on non-synchronized exoplanets. So basically, we know the planet, you know, all of the planets in solar system except Jupiter have significant planetary obliquity. And we know due to tidal forcing and uh, tidal you know, relaxation, and uh, this you know, hot Jupiter might have zero obliquity. But if it's far from the central star, you may have significant obliquity. Okay, so can we actually observe that? If there's no moon system, how do you observe a spin axis of, uh, you know, of a planet? I think atmosphere circulation may give you the hint, right? So, but first we have to understand what is atmosphere circulation looks like. What is the temperature pattern? What is the wind pattern looks like when you tilt the planet? Okay, so this is, a, this is a project. And again, I'm going to proposing minimal recipe, okay, a very good forcing pattern varying with time and liquidity, linear relaxation, linear friction, and zero eccentricity so far. Okay, and we can see what we can achieve when we tune the planet. This is my project. It's simple and it can be done. Perfect. <laughs> Pascal? It's not, it's not a real temperature because I don't have temperature there. But I can use a layer thickness to represent the temperature. Because a shallow, water, a shallow water model, you know, can be derived from, you know, 3D isentropic. No, 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 I don't do stigmatic. That's too complicated. Okay. <laughs> I just do layer thickness. Integrate the layer thickness over the sphere and see what it changes. You mean this one? Uh, well, all of your previous, I mean, I Tidal locked planet. Oh, you mean brown dwarf stuff? Or any, I mean, I don't, I don't everything, you're right. right, everything in atmospheric dynamics depends on rotation rate. Yeah, yeah because the Coriolis force is important. Unless you are in a different regime. Of course, Ted will tell you, there is some regime that Coriolis force is not important. Well, but, I, I think you know. I just meant your, you know, those internal heat versus radiative damping. Uh-huh. And that will depend versus the relationship. It also depends on the rotation rate, of course. <laughs> you are shifted a lot, uh, shifted, uh, you know, the position of that. Now, what did you assume for the rotation? Jupiter. Yeah. And I actually, actually changed the rotation rate, so, but I only show one, one re result. Okay, pretty good. You mean for brown dwarfs? Yeah. I use zonal wind, zonal mean, uh, zonal mean, zonal wind, compared with uh, you know standard deviation of the eddies. So if the zonal mean zonal wind exceeded the eddies, that means there is a bending structure because the mean flow is larger than the 